Welcome to episode number five of Oil Painting Question and Answers. If you have a question for me related to oil painting or painting realism, leave it in the comment section of this video and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can uh, in next week's episode. Uh, normally I do a little lesson before we get to the questions, but, and uh, today I'm not going to be doing a lesson because we've been hard at work on a new tutorial on the benefits of a limited palette, which is going to be coming out tomorrow. Um, and it's probably already out unless you're watching this video on Thursday night. Um, but in that video, I'm going to uh, go into great detail about um, all the benefits of using a limited palette and also the limitations of a limited palette. Um, and uh, just really get into the general discussion of why I personally have used a five color limited palette my entire career. And also, let me tell you about a new page that we have on Geneva Fine Art. And what we've done is we've listed, um, we've gone through and mixed the formulas for how to mix a, some really popular colors like Payne's Gray, uh, Burnt Sienna, Raw Sienna, Olive Green, a number of other colors. And we're going to be adding to that list. But it's just a simple formula using the Geneva Limited Palette and how you can mix all these other colors using the five colors in the Geneva Palette. Okay, let's get into viewers' questions. Would you care to comment on the digression, or progression if you like, of Rembrandt's work as he matured and aged as a painter? Um, I absolutely love Rembrandt's work. Um, not all of it, but his, uh, his later work, especially uh, his self-portrait as the Apostle Paul. It's one of my all-time favorite paintings. When I was younger, I used to tell everybody that that was my favorite painting. The expression that he's captured in this painting is just absolutely, um, you know, just has a huge impact on me. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. But his early work um, really doesn't do anything for me. Um, his his um, really stiff, super tight, you know, uh, super high realism paintings are very, very impressive. But, um, you know, personally, I just like uh, his looser brushwork. So that's just a matter of taste. Um, I used to think that Rembrandt couldn't paint hands very well in most paintings. I, I don't care for the way he's painted hands. Um, that said, there are some, some paintings where he painted beautiful, beautiful hands. But his self-portrait as the Apostle Paul, um, to this day, it still has a huge impact on me. Um, the expression that he, that he captured is just, uh, what can I say, it just really moves me. I want to know about your art educational background, both formal and informal. Um, I've never had any formal uh, art education. I studied uh, computer science uh, for the couple of years that I was in college, and then I dropped out and just started teaching myself to paint on my own. Um, when I first started to paint, uh, my father bought me a book uh, about painting, and I couldn't make heads or tails, tails of it because um, I just had a hard time understanding it. I've always been somebody that, you know, uh, never done well in school. I've always had a hard time learning things from other people. I kind of had to figure things out for myself. Um, and so just through my own struggling of trying to understand color and, and uh, how to draw and everything else, I, I developed my own method for painting. And uh, in fact, I was trying to uh, prepare a resume or a portfolio so that I could apply and try to get into a, a, a good art school. And um, in the process, before I knew it, I was um, you know, painting paintings and, and painting portraits and, and had a career and never uh, had to uh, take any formal classes or anything. The biggest way that I've learned to paint is but through observation of, the, of great artists. And I highly recommend studying great paintings not necessarily listening to what the critics had to say about it, not necessarily reading the books, but really just walking in museums and studying old paintings and, and the great artists that you love. And that is for sure the biggest, uh, the biggest way that I learned was by copying both old paintings, but by also just observing them and thinking about how they did their brushwork and how they did their colors and, and, and things like that. Will Geneva paint be coming to stores, and is Geneva going to be making canvases? Um, as far as uh, selling in retail stores, we don't have any plans to do that at, that at this time. 
Um, the, the, one of the things about selling directly from our website to customers is we make the paint and then we sell it. And that cuts out a lot of the cost of, of not just distribution and everything else, but also uh, having to pay a huge uh, percentage, you know, 40, 50 percent to retailers. And so we can pass that savings on to the customer. And that's why Geneva paint is, you know, premium, premium paint with super high pigment load and everything else. But it really the price, if you break it down per milliliter, is very comparable to, to the big brands like Winsor Newton and Gamblin and everybody else. As far as making canvases go, um, you know, one of the rules that I have about anything that we introduce, um, it's got to be better than anything available to artists in the world. So I feel like our paint is the best paint in the world. It's, it's what I use, and I'm very picky about my paint, and I, I like it better than anything I've ever painted with before in my life. Um, the e artist easel that we currently sell, I think, is the best uh, artist easel in the world for a number of reasons. And so everything that we introduce is going to be uh, better than anything available. So if we can figure out how to make canvas better than anybody else, uh, one day maybe we'll introduce that as a product. Do you have any tips on tonalism? How to start a painting, colors, and composition, etc.? Uh, I don't have any tips on tonalism because I'm not uh, familiar with that and haven't practiced it. Um, basically, the way that I teach to paint is to paint what you see. So there's uh, uh, no creativity in that. It's just a matter of the creativity comes in how you set up you know, your subject matter or what you decide to paint or how you do your composition. But as far as uh, teaching to paint and understanding color, I think the very best way to understand color is to m match your colors from life when you're starting out. And that's going to teach you more than you could ever learn by doing color charts or anything else. I originally painted from dark values to light values, no matter where they fell on the canvas. However, I now am finding myself painting from the top left corner to the bottom right. How do you cover your canvas? Well, the truth is, is that I jump around myself all the time, but when I teach people to paint and when I taught my workshops, I used to insist that everybody work dark to light, meaning that paint all the darkest let's say you're working on a face or a vase, it doesn't matter, but paint every single dark value, no matter what the color, you know, the, the darkest black in the eye, the darkest black in the in line in the lips and in, in, in the nose, and so that you build all these values together in the hair and the, under the chin and it all, and so as, the, if you paint in dark to light like that and you're very uh, strict about it, you will, you will see the likeness much sooner and you will start to see the face develop on your canvas and that gives you a much better uh, 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 perspective on trying to get the drawing right or trying to get the, keep the likeness in line versus just finishing an eye and then finishing a mouth or moving left to right. So, so that's a real big advantage and, and also if you ever, uh, you know, if you, as you move away from this method or you, you know, get more and more developed as an artist, you know, at some point it would be nice just to sit down in a room and just pick up some dark value and start to paint it in. And you would always do that by dark to light so that you could kind of see the, the, the face develop on the canvas instead of just jumping all over the place and waiting till the end until you can see it develop. And the truth is, is that, you know, in, in teaching some of my lessons, uh, I was forced to, to, you know, obey those rules because um, I'm teaching people that, so I wanted to demonstrate it. And I really discovered that, that it was a mistake for me to, 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 you know, let my guard down and start jumping around and, and finishing one thing before another. And it really is best to always work dark to light. Do you think one can be successful using only high quality photographs as a source for painting realistic portraits? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, when I first started, I did not uh, work from photographs. I had models sit for me, but I quickly uh, discovered that that was not going to work as, as a living portrait artist traveling all over the place. You know, um, the, in, back when Sargent painted, painted, for instance, just to give you an example, he, there, there was a family that hired him to, to do their portrait and they shipped all their living room furniture over to London for the summer to have their family portrait done. So they all went over as a family, took their belongings, set it all up in his studio and he painted their portrait one summer. Well, you can imagine 
uh, in today's world that would be unheard of. And so even asking a model to s sit for eight hours a day or, or you know, five hours a day for five days in a row is really a lot to ask uh, for whatever reason. People just don't expect that. And so if, if you're going to um, be a portrait artist, uh, you can certainly uh, insist on working from life, but it's, uh, it's going to limit, limit you and, and who you paint, and it's also going to limit the number of portraits that you can do. So it's just a, a, a compromise that I made early on and decided that I had to teach myself to take good, good photographs. But that is, that is a very big point, is learning how to take a good photograph. And unlike a photographer who has to maybe learn a lot about effects and how to use special lighting and all that, what an artist really uh, is only objective, and this is my own, my own opinion about this, but the, that what an artist uses a camera for is it's a tool uh, in place of real life so that you want to learn to make prints that are the same color, the same value, that accurately represent what you're looking at. And so that's really important. And there's a really great in-depth guide on drawmixpaint.com about how to do just that. The entire guide is geared for, for the artist and teaching you how to use a camera, use a manual camera, how to shoot raw, how to take pictures, and end up with prints that look just like real life or as close as you can get them to real life. Um, and so certainly you can do it. But that's really important because uh, if you just go and take pictures and use the default settings on your camera and just make prints, you're going to end up with prints and colors that are really far, far from natural color and unlike uh, what you see when you look at sitting in a room looking at the subject in person. When working on a large painting, do you ever mix some color groups and paint certain portions or objects and then mix some more color groups for remaining portions or objects and paint the rest? Um, absolutely. You know, when I was painting large full-length portraits, um, I, I had to decide what I wanted to paint. I knew that it would dry. For instance, I would always start with the face but always paint a little bit of background around whatever object you're painting. And that way if, it's, if it dries and you come back to it, you can blend into that background and not have to blend into, you know, say their hair or, or, or a shirt or whatever. Because if you, if you say paint a shoulder and then that dries hard and then you just come in with some background and bump it right up into the shirt, you're going to get that hard line and it's, gonna, it's just not going to be the same as working wet into wet. So what I would do is paint a little bit of background and then come back uh, when I, after that's dried when I want to paint some more and just paint and blend right into that background without actually touching the object and that way you won't see a blend line at all. But yeah, you have to be very strategic that way. Um, otherwise, you know, you'd have to paint a big, you know, huge painting all in one go, which would not be practical at all. How do I get an honest opinion on the quality of my paintings from knowledgeable professionals such as yourself? That's a good question. I think that uh, at the heart of this question is that you have to be honest with yourself and you have to uh, develop an eye to look at your own paintings and compare them to those artists that you love in a very honest way. And that's a really difficult thing to do. It took me years to finally um, have the ability to you know, compare my work to say Sargent or some of those great artists. But if you're not painting at, those, at that level, and even if you are, you can always improve so really, it's a matter of coming up with the right tools to evaluate your own paintings and whether that's checking your colors. I mean, if your colors, if you're looking at your source, and I can point in into the shadow of, let's say you've painted a face, and if I point into the shadow on the face, and then I pull up your subject, let's say you're working from a photograph, and if the shadow on your face is a, is a different value, let's say it's lighter, than the shadow on your source photograph, then you've got it wrong and you've got to fix it. You've got, if you want to paint realism well, you've got to get your values in check. That's number one. So that would be one example of something that you can, can look at, you can evaluate, and you can, fix, you can fix it by checking colors, by going back to the basics, or whatever it is. But you have to, uh, you know, if, if your brushwork is all smoothed out and everything's blended, well, you can look at these great artists if you like artists like Sargent like I do or, or Repin or whoever it is and look at their brushwork and see how it's all jumbled up and how it's not all smoothed together 
And so really it's just a matter of learning how to evaluate your own work and to make that judgment for yourself because it doesn't matter who it is, you can go talk to the you know, top critic in the world, art critic in the world, and, and pay them a million dollars to evaluate your painting. But in the end, you have to ask yourself you know, whether they're even right or not. They, they could you know, tear your work apart and, and, and it would be for all the wrong reasons. So you really have to ultimately be able to depend on your, yourself uh, to evaluate your own work and to be honest with yourself. What have you found to be the best way to store your oil paintings? I tend to paint mostly on panels and I haven't framed most of them. I feel like stacking them in any way is not good at all. I'm also limited on space, but I'm open to any ideas or advice for storing these properly without damaging them. Um, that's a good question. Absolutely don't stack them. You don't want anything uh, making contact with the oil surface. Um, and, you, and the other thing is that once they've dried for a couple, three months, they need to be varnished because that will really protect the oil film uh, long term. If you don't put varnish on a painting, the dust that gets into the oil paint will accumulate and you'll never be able to clean it. Um, like you will if, you know, what varnish does is bar varnish puts a seal uh, on top of the oil paint and then, uh, you know, 20 years from now, uh, you can remove the very upper layer of the varnish and re-varnish it and, and the paint is, it's like it's fresh paint again. Uh, but if you don't put varnish on, then dirt and grime will get into the paint and you'll never be able to get it out. Um, and then as far as uh, stack, you know, storing them, uh, store them in a place where dust can't settle into them. Um, but other than that, you know, it just, uh, it can be a problem. If you have so many paintings, uh, you may have to go uh, rent a storage uh, unit to store them in. <laughs> well, that's the end of today's show. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a question for me, uh, leave it in the comment section of this video, and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can next week. Um, and be sure to check out our new video on the benefits of using a limited palette, which you can find at drawmixpaint.com.